this on? Yes, this is on. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Design at Large. Um, I'm really excited to introduce Dr. Norman Sue, who's come to speak to us today. Norman Sue is an assistant professor of informatics and computer science at the University of Indiana in Bloomington. And he's somebody that I, I deeply admire for the way that he brings HCI together with questions of culture and humanities questions about how people exist in the world, how people value things in the world, um, and how that affects the way societies are structured. So like Norm Sue is one of the people that if you look at his publications list, he's not just he's never talking about people in the general and what design can do for them. He has a paper on the subcultures of hunters. And what is it that these hunters do together? What activities do they engage in? What are their values? And how does that affect the way they relate to technology that might be different than the way you and I relate to technology? He's got another paper on music listening, which is something that doesn't, you know, it can involve like your body and your guts, and not just your ears. And like, how do you think about designing human computer interaction for something that's both as old as people are, like, aesthetic auditory experience, but then also you know, fully embodied in ways that aren't captured by a mobile device or a mouse. Um, and actually, when I, we were in grad school together, so I've been tracking his work for a long time. And he did a paper when we were in grad school on the culture of Street Fighter. Would you want to talk about how people interact with computers in ways that really, really matter to them and are high stakes? Now at a time when Twitch is a huge part of people's media experience. Not that I claim to understand Twitch, to be honest. <laughs> but I did understand Street Fighter. I played a lot of Street Fighter in high school. And Norman was one of the first people to really bring out that kind of immersive gaming, like social experience. So really excited to welcome him today. And please, let's give him a hand for coming out and visiting us. Thank you. OK, Ken, is the, is the mic on? It's, it's working? Is it? Yes? OK. OK, thanks, Lily, for the wonderful introduction. Uh, it's always been a dream of mine to be introduced by Dr. Lily Irani, so now it's been fulfilled. I'm, I'm so happy about that. Um, so uh, today, I'm going to be talking about um, the research I do with my students and collaborators. And, and the kind of, is it not on? Do I need to turn on the switch? I'm all wired up everywhere, so. Is that OK? OK, it's working now. OK, so the research I do with my students and collaborators, I study subcultures. And uh, I, I want to study the opportunities to learn from and desi design with subcultures. And in this talk, I'm going to use this following notion of subcultures. So first, uh, subcultures are really subgroups with practices that are outside, but not necessarily in opposition to the mainstream. And second, they have traditions, customs, and values that really are a strong basis of their identity. I think subcultures are really interesting because they really are a lens into where mainstream society is going often. You can think of subcultures as sort of these future visions of where you know, uh, contemporary culture is going. So you know, in the 1970s, you know, shoes designed by, for skateboarding by Vans really became emblematic of skater culture and eventually became part of mainstream shoe fashion. You know, many of the shoes you see right now look like Van shoes, and not all of us are skaters wearing these shoes. And uh, if you look at um, you know the sort of uh, discourse now about feminism and feminism movements, back in the 1970s, um, there were these sort of sisterhood movements that gathered together face to face, and they created books like Our Bodies, Ourselves, and they were already talking about things like uh, reproductive rights, uh, lesbian lesbian sexuality, and sexual independence. So all things that are already somewhat, not, not quite there yet, but being talked about now in contemporary culture. <coughs> so in this talk, I want to talk about um, a few key points here. And it's really the problem of designing for subcultures or with subcultures. And it has to do with both unity and diversity. So subcultures are outwardly united by sort of canonical values. There's sort of identities and traditions that everyone in subculture sort of agrees about. Um, but the way people interpret and practice these values are often diverse and sometimes in conflicting ways. But both of these things, canonical values and how they're interpreted, are continually performed, enacted, and changing. And of course, we always have to think of this in the context of mainstream society. Subcultures are influenced by and influencing mainstream societies. And really, technologies are often the key sites where a lot of these debates and discussions are going about 
you know, what are the values, how do I enact values, and how does technology interact with that? So much of my work is answering sort of these two questions, you know, what is the role of technology in canonical values and enactment of these values? And the question is, how do we, or can we even design for both diversity and unity together here? And I, I want to make an argument that these sort of questions are also matters of humanistic concern. So when we talk about things like, you know, what are the right values to live by, and how does technology affect that? It's asking questions about what do you think is an authentic life? What does it mean to live to the fullest potential as human beings? And how is technology affecting that? And these are things that people from the humanities have been talking about all this time. And I'm very interested to see is there ways that humanities can help us think about these problems. So uh, to, I'm, today I'm going to also argue that it is fruitful to do HCI research with cultures by marrying em empirical methods and uh, humanistic strategies. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the nitty gritty or the pragmatics of using humanities in HCI. You know, where does it occur in the research process? And what are the problems and challenges of trying to combine the two together? So in my uh, research lab, uh, my students and collaborators have done a lot of studies on a, a number of different subcultures. Uh, we've looked at domestic spaces, like minimalists, you know, professionals, like roboticists, uh, religious groups, um, leisure activities, um, activists. So we looked at uh, recent work is on menopause subreddits and activists there. And uh, recently, I've been doing a lot of work on rural subcultures of, um, as well. But today, I, I want to just uh, talk about two particular subcultures that sort of embody the use of humanities and or the empirical to ask questions about technology or entangled values and practices. So I'll be talking about, as I really kind of allude to, the Irish traditional musicians. And then I'm going to switch over also to talk about a rural subculture of Midwest hunters. So um, I did a postdoc in Ireland, Dublin a while ago, um, and I studied Irish traditional musicians. Does anyone play Irish traditional music here? No one? OK. <laughs> so uh, what is Irish traditional music? So you go to a pub, and then there's a session going on there, and musicians are playing together. There's a few key points here. Tunes are played in a public space, like a pub or restaurant. Repetition is a key. You see the same tune played over and over. So it really is an oral tradition. And trad musicians play sets of tunes together. So some tunes go well together with each other. So I did a two-year ethnography. I basically learned how to play Irish music and you know, learn the tradition. And uh, what I want to talk about here is that uh, here, um, traditional musicians, there's an increasing amount of technology that is coming into their subculture. So ways to learn traditional music quicker, uh, ways to learn uh, what kind of tunes are out there. And uh, these kind of computer representations are causing some tensions within that group. And I, I want to argue here that literary theory can offer a useful lens to understand representation as a creatful, creative process with pervasive technology. So traditional musicians are always thinking about what is a representation of music? What, how do I represent music? Yeah. No, and, I, and feel free to push this off later. Yeah. One thing I was curious about is when I saw your list of uh, issues first disciplines that I thought of were big button, anthropology, yeah. sociology. And um, I'm curious about your motivation for uh, skipping over them for uh, other stuff. I mean, I feel like all parts of the university have lots to offer. But you know, if I were to go for the obvious right. ninth, I would have picked a different one. Yeah. Um, you mean, uh, you wouldn't have to literary theory in this case. Is that what you're referring to here? Well, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I, I, you could probably put X can offer in the school. Right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, but it seems like there's a different question, which is uh, where can we get the most value or something? Or maybe not very much. Yeah. So I, I wouldn't, uh, that's a good question. I wouldn't frame it in terms of that I'm kind of putting aside anthropology and sociology. I am using, you know, techniques from ethno ethnography, you know, which have, you know, are used by anthropologists and such, and it's used in conjunction with this literary theory. So I'll, I'll go into more detail about that. But it's rather the, the two together, not one is prioritized over the other here. Okay, so um, this literary theory I'm going to talk about is called reader reception theory here. And it's the basic idea is you pick up a book, a piece of a text, and this, these theorists, the literary theorists, are trying to come up with an idea of what does it mean to create something that is a valuable text? 
right? When does something become a literary work, something that's worthy of Shakespeare forever? And reader reception theory actually says that it's not the critics or the historians of literature that determine whether uh, some work becomes something that is raised up to the level of Shakespeare. Rather, the reader has a lot to do with it, okay? <coughs> so a literary work, according to this theory, is only brought into existence within this virtual space where the reader's background and the background of the text merge. So I'll, I'll explain that concept clearer later. But the, the implication here is each time I read a book, a new work appears, okay? So every time I read a book, I get a new interpretation, I find something new. Each reading is gonna give me something new, right? And that kind of defines when something becomes valuable here. And this is part of the constant school of literary criticism. So, uh, the implication here is that in order to produce value work, you need two sort of ingredients. You need a creative text and you need an imaginative reader. You need both. Without one of either of them, you can't create something that is great. So a good text will defy a reader's expectations, allowing multiple variations of interpretations. And the real aesthetic pleasure you get from reading a book comes from the tension and having expectations, but then being surprised by the text you're reading, right? Because it violates some of your expectations, right? So, you know, sometimes you read a good fiction and it's so ridiculous and far out of reality that's not enjoyable, right? Or you read some fiction that is just so mundane and part of everyday boring life, then it's not exciting, right? So you need to find that balance in between the two. <coughs> So uh, Paul Fry gives a, a really nice metaphor uh, about this, a professor of English at Yale, of a spark plug. And basically for that magic to happen, you need that gap that in the spark plug to be just right, right? Too much and there's no spark and too little of a gap, you short out, right? So you need that movement between the reader and the text to be just right to get that magic and then a real valuable work happens. So as it so happens, this kind of theory is, is really good fit for what Irish traditional musicians think about. So when Irish traditional musicians are thinking about learning a tune or playing music, they're always looking for what is the right text from which I can learn that tune, okay? So there might be a tune that is called, um, you know, the Lilting Banshee, right? And you look it up online and there's gonna be millions of versions. So you're always looking for the right version and you want to be able to read that tune over and over and have the right skeleton enough version that you can come up with your own variations and such. So trad musicians are always developing their literary work. And what we found in our findings is that if you want to create value art, actually sometimes having digital forms of music impedes the creation of value work. So when you have uh, transcriptions of sheet music here, and uh, not the audio recordings, they don't really show you the potential value the tune has. Musicians always kept telling us, I need to hear other people play it. I need to hear their variations on the tune. And based on their reading, then I can build up my own value work from this. So what they're looking for in the text is something non-authoritative, non-prescriptive. You know, it has to talk about its history and provenance. Uh, a tune should be experienced in a session and it has to so support social playing, right? So the kind of t requirements for a text are hard to realize through digital media and forms here. Scott. So I feel like all representations uh, lubricate some forms of value creation and and that digital ain't special. Right. Digital ain't special. You mean digital is not more so worse than other forms. Well, just that, um, I, so I totally agree with your first bullet, right. and I see it as an instance of a more general phenomenon, which is that uh, different representational types uh, uh, analyze or impede different kinds of value creation. Yeah, yeah. Like, certainly sheet music is real handy for a bunch of kinds of value creation, and it, and it impedes the you know, value creation in the other ways. Right, right. Um, and so, what, what, so are you saying that it's, it should not be placed in a special category? No, yeah, like a, offering, yeah, yeah. offering a generalization of the first bullet, which is that different representations uh, lubricate kinds of value right. <laughs> I would say maybe what makes it special in this case in some, in some ways is that the sort of digital forms that of tunes are available now, you know, traditionally it's a, it's a very old tradition, so they did not rely on digital forms or sheet music 
You know, people would record things on tape recorders and hear them that way. And so having it down in a kind of static form, right? So when you have a recording, for example, uh, the tune is typically played multiple times. So you're he already hearing the variations that are happening in the tune, right? But the sheet music often only represents one version. Of course, they can list multiple versions, but often more than not, it's just one version of the tune, right? Yeah, and they have the sheet music. They do, but oftentimes, at least in the online sources that we see, they'll just list one version. So that can be one of the issues with this. So you're saying this community skips the written, uh, printed uh, music text? I'm not saying they skipped it. So traditionally, the Irish music is written in ABC format, which is here where you just write the letters here. Right? That's the traditional. And it's a skeleton format. Right? But what I'm saying is here, you know, these sort of sheet music representations, you know, sometimes they can go too much. So sometimes they detail too much of the ornamentations and the variations. And so there's not much room to vary across that, right? Or sometimes uh, it doesn't tell you the different variances either, right? So you can't build a value text. OK. So um, based, based on this, what we did was created this basic framework of trying to understand uh, Irish traditional music as, as a notion of, you know, when you're learning a tune, it's actually about uh, learning the basic tune, knowing it, and retaining it, because Irish traditional musicians typically know thousands of tunes by heart, actually, right? And if you go to any session and you use sheet music, you'll be kicked out immediately, okay? So you can't use sheet music there. So these are sort of the canonical values that I think most traditional musicians would agree, right? Uh, music is passed through orally learning it. Uh, it's flexible representation. There's no single representation of a tune. You have to respect the history of the tunes. It's a social event, and you have to balance individuality with the group, right? You can't go off doing jazz riffs on an Irish tune in a session, right? It still has to maintain respect with the tune here. So these values are actually quite hard for novices to realize, right? So if you go to a session and you see people playing thousands of different tunes, and each session you go to, each place you go to has their own repertoire they built over many years. So we decide. Thinking about that, we want to try to help support novice and visiting musicians who lack the history of tune playing practice in the session, right? So by making this history public, it would help one become part of a session's history in a way. So we developed this system in, in Ireland uh, called Tune Tracker, and we deployed it probably the most foremost place for uh, Irish traditional music in Dublin, which is a cobblestone pub here. And it's uh, basically a, a system up here uh, running with a, a microphone sticking out here, and in the corner of the pub, there's the musicians playing. And you can think of it as like a Shazam that's always running, right? So it, it recognizes the tunes that are being played, and it posts it on a website that everyone can see the names of the tunes, so you can get a sense of the repertoire of that, what's playing there. So just to give an idea of, of the kind of interface that we had, so you go to this website, and you could see like, you know, on Sunday, uh, November afternoon, you know, uh, someone played O'Connell's Church to Parliament at 2 p.m. there, okay? And over time, statistics are calculated and collected, and you can see, for example, if I want to join Monday sessions, maybe I should be playing, you know, uh, the Father Kelly's reel over here because it's been played 16 times. That seems to be a tune that comes up often. So that is a tune I can practice and join in in the session there. So once we deployed this system for about maybe uh, almost a year, um, it brought a lot of controversy, okay? So, like, we did the ethnographic field work, the necessary connections. We talked with a pub owner who comes from a long line of history of respected Irish traditional musicians. We talked to professionals. We passed out flyers. We did everything by the book. And when we deployed systems, people started protesting. So what they did was the musicians who played in the front of the pub, they moved to the back to avoid being surveilled by the system there, right? Because they don't want to be captured, right? Now, there's no, there's no identifying information here, right? But, you know, sometimes you can identify people by the tunes they play. Like, I know that Norman likes these three sets of tunes. So he'll, someone talked to us and said, I got a text from my friend saying, I saw you're playing there last night because I know those are the tunes that you like to play, yeah. right? So there's, there's some scary aspects about that. Um, so what happened was, you know, we have these canonical values here, and we developed this system to, we were hoping to help amateurs and professionals, right? And you know, amateurs talked to us, and some professionals told us that it was good because I could see the repertoire of our session. It's written somewhere in catalog. And you know, if I'm playing tunes and I don't have enough polkas being played, 
that means that I'm not representing, I'm from Kerry, I like polkas, right? That's in Ireland, so I want to represent that in my session, right? It can help foster a new generation of musicians. They can make things globally public. It's really about handing over tunes. But a lot of professional musicians just thought it's going to create a tune monster, right? Someone's going to print out the tunes from the website, bring them over to the session, and say, why aren't you playing it, these tunes in this order, right? Um, and many musicians felt a, a certain ownership of tunes, even though like, they're like hundreds or hundreds of years old, right? They've entered the public domain. And they're worried that the cobblestone would, would represent an exemplar Irish session, right? So that other sessions would start comparing to the cobblestone and want to play their tunes, and you'd get this homogenization over time and losing of dialects of music, okay? So we, after a year, we decided to dismantle the system, even though the pub owner was very uh, encouraging and wanted to, us to keep doing that, but we thought um, ethically it would not be right, and we were worried that he would lose business over this, actually. <coughs> so um, once we had to deploy the system, I, I kind of sat back and said, where did we sort of go wrong, right? So you know, we did the ethnographic work. Uh, we got lots of different perspectives, but despite that, you could say the system was, in some sense, uh, a failure, right? Um, it brought loud debate, a lot of loud dissenting voices. So um, when I was trying to understand the findings and trying to discover like what, what could we do better than that, and, and I started turning to the humanities memory to kind of think about that, right? So uh, ethnographic work gave me one perspective into this, but maybe there's ways to understand you know, uh, why people were fighting over this, right? And in philosophy and HCI, I think it, if you use philosophy, there's kind of two benefits you get from that. First is, um, philosophy allows you to frame understandings of users. So when you read a philosoph philosophical work, um, they think hard about, philosophers think hard about ethics and morality and what is the right way to live, right? Or what are the kinds of lives we can live, right? And an important thing um, I was talking to with a few folks today is that Philosophy, philosophers write in a certain style to convince you of certain moral frameworks and ways to live, right? Their writing style is a strategy. And so can we learn from that strategy and how somehow translate that to design strategies possibly, right? So just like philosophers write in a certain way to convince the reader, is there ways for designs to be designed to convince the user about a certain way to live? So we took a step and we started thinking about, okay, can you reimagine ethnographic investigations into a philosophical framework? So uh, we turned to um, Soren Kierkegaard. He's an existentialist uh, philosopher. Anyone read Kierkegaard here? Have some? Okay, good. Um, so he's arguably the first existential philosopher, and he's really answering basic questions about what does it mean to fulfill uh, humanity's potential, right? And he talks about three different ways of living, which he calls spheres of existence, right? Aesthetic, ethical, and religious ways of living. <coughs> I'll go more into those later. And we can also think about the way Kierkegaard tried to convince his readers. So he did it in a very tricky way. But when Kierkegaard wrote his works, he always used pseudonyms, right? And if you look at the prefaces of his works, he always has these elaborate stories of coming upon a secret compartment in a desk and finding a stack of papers. And now I've decided to publish this work and let the reader digest it and understand it. So in this way, Kierkegaard is using a technique he called indirect communication. So he is trying to convince you. He does have a certain angle that he thinks is the right way to live. But he's not going to tell you directly. He wants you to come up with it and reach his conclusion ideally. right? So. By reading this work and removing himself as the author, he removes his authority. And if you're able to come up with that, a conclusion about what's the right way to live, uh, his argument is that that is much more persuasive, right, than, than simply a philosopher saying, I'm Kierkegaard, this is the right way to live. Okay, so how do we use this, right? So um, I'm gonna talk about just uh, two of the spheres due to time and how we sort of fit that into these sort of different spheres of existence here. So I'm gonna talk about the aesthetic musician and the ethical musician, again, in the context of Irish traditional musicians here. So the aesthetic musician lives for the immediate pleasure and, and that's what they seek. So he prides himself in enjoying music without commitment and the world is his playground to experiment. The aesthetic musician is an adept user of tune tracker so he knows everything about sessions instantly. He knows what tunes to practice beforehand. And he's confident 
in his ability to become a member of any session that's out there. So he'll never be left out and revels in the thrill of playing together. And so though his ability to immediately play together with strangers gives him vo joy, he also seeks to play his own tunes, right? And he wants to be in the spotlight, and he may play some virtuosic tunes that will impress, but yet few players can join in. And one of the weaknesses of the aesthetic musicians is that he may quickly become bored, so jumping from session to session without establishing or understanding a history with local musicians in pubs. Tune Tracker also serves as a great leveler. It puts all participants of the session on the same level and compresses the session into a nameless list of tunes, and possibly sessions might lose their individuality. So that's one sort of mode of living uh, in terms of our Irish traditional musicians. In contrast, the ethical musician is willing to sacrifice his immediate desire to play as many tunes as possible, to find his place in tradition. So he gives music its proper profundity and a socially situated practice with a rich local history. So tradition dictates toughing it out. The ethical musician might just be sitting there in a session with his instrument in his lap and never playing for a while because he has to tough it out and learn the tunes through a year. He, he's not a tourist traveling from one pub to the right session. He values the playing of old masters and he utilizes sources on the internet to find how such masters have interpreted tunes. Right, and Tune Tracker supports sort of an egalitarian spirit of trad music and provides a pathway by which musicians from different countries and skill levels can join sessions and respect tradition. So, in some sense, the Tune Tracker version that we originally made could be seen as representing the aesthetic mode of living. It provides immediate results, it provides, you know, in situ real time statistics about Irish tune playing practices, immediate gratification here, right? But one can imagine, let's make an indirect tune tracker, a tune tracker that indirectly communicates a certain way of living, right? Uh, I'm just going to show just one hypothetical example here. So let's say you ex imagine an ethical mode of it, right? This is the tune tracker that is meant to be used by an ethical player, right, to, to, to uh, affirm that way of living, right? And so this one, we require the player to get a password from a local player to access tune tracker's records, right? So it affirms that sessions are locally public but globally private here. Okay, so this sort of approach, uh, we've been calling designing for authenticity here. And what it does is it, it, it's, it's um, making designs that support a user archetype that is drawn from field work, right? And um, it's not the intent that archetypes should, uh, these sort of modes should only fit with a uh, what way of living a, a user wants. It, it, if we follow what Kierkegaard says, everyone needs to be exposed to all different ways of living, right? And then decide to make a choice of which is the right way to be a trad musician here, right? <coughs> so the idea here is hopefully that this sort of, there'll be some empathy that when you're forced to act as another user, right? When you're forced to act as an aesthetic musician, when you're forced to act as an ethical musician, then you'll see what it's like to be another musician, and then you can make a a uh, reasonable choice between the two. <coughs> okay, so I, I talked about design for authenticity, how we got to this path, and I, I want to kind of switch gears here and talk to how, similar to Irish trad musicians, the next subculture has many divisive opinions as well. And, you know, when I moved to Indiana in particular, hunting is really a large part of rural culture here. <coughs> And so the goal of this work here that we've been doing in Indiana is really to look at and kind of problematize what does it mean to be a user of nature here, right? And I, I want to talk about how there is a canonical values associated with nature, but there's also a, a lot of oppositional values, practice, and artifacts that are happening in this uh, subculture here. And so um, we did a two-year ethnography here, uh, participant observation, 14 interviews here. And really, the, the, the canonical value here is about a uh, fair chase here, right? So this is the moral compass which guided all hunters in their practices here. Um, so basically, it's the ethical, sportsmanlike, and lawful pursuit and taking of any free-ranging, wild, native North American big game. And it has to be done in a manner that does not give the hunter an improper advantage over animals. So what this means is that uh, the ethos of fair chase is having a challenge you don't want to cheat the animal. You need to understand the animal's innate skills. So that means knowing things like deer have poor eyesight. 
good sense of smell, but turkeys are kind of the opposite. They have uh, really good eyesight, but bad uh, sense of smell. Um, it also means respecting the harvest, the hunting of the animals, the so shooting, tracking, and gutting, and transportation of it. And it also emphasizes a return to nature and having rural skills. So all hunters really rally behind canonical value of fair chase here. But uh, I'm going to talk about how we can also frame their practices, just as I use reader reception theory here. We can also look at it in terms of in a dialectic manner here, in terms of oppositions here, which is a useful to way to look at how hunters talk about and espouse their values. So I'm going to talk about two ways hunters talk about their dialectics. And it's in the hunt and in the lay of the land. So first, the, the weapon choice, which I'm, I'm thinking of is a kind of technology here, really embodies how you decide to enact fair chase, okay? the weapon you choose to use in hunting. And uh, the lay of the land means how do you try to understand how species interact with the land? What kind of technologies do you use? And the way you use those also embody what you think is the right way to do fair chase. So I'll use a few examples here. Um, in uh, Indiana, there's a muzzle loading uh, uh, season. So that's a season where you use this gun like the old style on the Revolutionary War where you have to put the ball in, the lead ball in, the gunpowder and put it all the way down. And some hunters force themselves to use this gun, right? Because what it does is it enforces a kind of fair chase. So each shot, you can only take one shot and that shot has to really matter, right? You can't, once that shot goes off, the animal is going to run off. <coughs> and uh, the, uh, we the weather conditions drastically affect the, the reliability of muzzle loaders as well. So you're now at the, the mercy of nature and if it rains and things like that. So each shot counts, you have to shoot humanely. And here uh, one of the hunters told us that, you know, in his group they decided that one shot of higher velocity, higher effective range was more important than multiple shots. That's the, that's the fair chase I'm going to adopt with muzzle loaders. And I've set myself in contrast with rifle shooters here. Also, hunters are very cognizant of stereotypes uh, that they get. So I heard in multiple interviews that they, they realize that other people, especially from urban areas, call them you know, white trash, hicks, uh, rednecks, those kind of derogatory terms. And so uh, they know that these other sort of hunters who don't know the right way to represent fair chase through social media might be harming them. So if you post you know, animals with guts or blood or spasms, um, if you position yourself in an unrespectful way after you've harvested the animal, like you're laying on top of the animal, you tell your feet on the antlers, saying like, you know, I'm, I'm the man kind of thing, or you just throw the animal in the trunk and drive around. Um, all those things posted on social media give the, uh, a bad name to hunting and violates fair chase here. And this is especially problematic in terms of the kind of battles hunters have to face daily with the public, non-hunters, right? and also with what they call antis, or people who are against hunting. And finally, a, a big debate happening right now in hunting is surveillance via trail cams. So uh, hunters now often deploy trail cams in private land or land where they're allowed to, and now they can surveil movement of deer and other wildlife there. And so they actually got a very good sense of what kind of wildlife is living in that place. And as a result of that, um, hunting changes from a more ad hoc uh, you know, nature into something that's more planned. So uh, one uh, biologist we talked to said that hunters, um, they're seeing these big bucks come in at night on the camera. They'll go on for an entire season, not shoot a deer because they're waiting for that one animal and they've even named the animal, right? And they're thinking that those are their own animals. They own the animals. And they see them every day on the camera. So the camera drastically changes the notion of fair chase, it, it, it reduces the need to do scouting, right? To scout for deer, look for patterns through other means once you have the trail cams up there. So um, there's a lot of different social worlds of hunting that I'm not going to get into here, but basically there's a lot of these competing sort of values and ways to realize fair chase, and these groups are constantly in opposition with each other. <laughs> And so what, what, is the, you know, what is sort of the takeaway here of studying these sort of um, hunters? I, th I think there's a, some really interesting things about hunters actually we can learn for design in general. And, and one of the things is that values are not always rigid. Okay, so when hunters adopt different weapons, many hunters do crossbow hunting, bow hunting, 
they do muzzle the loading, and they like donning these different hats and getting these different values when they put on these different weapons. So when I become a muzzle loading, uh, you know, shooter, I change what I value in hunting. I have to change the challenges and what I think of the animal, right? And people like to think to adopt their values here. And so weapons, you can think of it in terms of Kierkegaard, they enable sort of different spheres of existence already. What, that's what it's doing. And a lot of hunters we talked to talked about fair chase, but they also realized that they often failed in reaching these ideals, right? These canonical values, right? Fair chase sometimes has a very high lofty goals about what it means to do that. And hunters tell us a lot of what we call failure stories, right? Failures of living up to their ethical uh, mandates, right? And so there's always a case that people are striving for ideals but not necessarily reaching them. <coughs> so I, one of the key aspects here I want to emphasize is that if you want to design for these multiple groups, you need to talk about not only their interpretive practices, but the symbolic value of these canonical values, right? So the, the fact that hunters like to talk about fair chase, but they do it differently, doesn't mean we should abandon fair chase just because it's interpreted differently, right? So the symbolic value of fair chase is actually very useful for hunters here. So if we want to talk about maybe looking at this through this uh, sort of framework I talked about designing for authenticity, uh, one kind of tool we're exploring right now uh, with um, rural hunters and uh, with the Department of Natural uh, uh, Resources in Indiana is to think about ways to bridge between rural populations and the scientists that are hired by the DNR. So actually right now there's a huge debate going on about um, how are the seasons and deer harvesting limits set. So hunters are constantly complaining that, you know, I see all around me deer, but why don't you let me hunt right now, right? And the biologists are saying, you don't understand the global trends in the data we're collecting, right? So they're, they're both right in some aspect, right? But the rural hunters feel like their knowledge is being dismissed, right? They're just country knowledge, they don't understand it, and scientific knowledge is the pres prestigious sort of knowledge here, right? So perhaps we can design an animal tracker that has both, you know, kind of a scientist mode and this rural hunter mode, right? The scientist mode would present sort of the scientist mode of view of data of hunters, right? And present a global weight statewide pattern, predicted movements, and rationale for recent announcements of deer harvesting limits. Whereas rural hunters would be valued for their expertise. They could contribute their own local data and they could talk about their own country knowledge and local knowledge about the patterns there. Okay, so having described the ways technology intersects with canonical values and their interpretation, I kind of want to turn to the matter of uh, pragmatics with hu humanities. So in each of these uh, cases before, I found it useful to kind of marry both humanities and the empirical to both understand design with subcultures. So first, you can use humanities as a theoretical lens onto practices that are in the humanities. And another way is you can think of that in some ways that human humanistic methods can help address what I'll call here sort of deficiencies sometimes in empirical methods here. And this is, is sort of in parallel in conversations that are happening um, out there with humanistic HCI. So um, uh, the Barzells have talked about that humanistic HCI is a perspective that deploys humanistic epistemologies and methodologies in service of HCI, right? And they're sort of arguing we need to start doing research to build better bridges between humanities and HCI. And one of the ways that's been done many times is critical interpretation of empirical data, right? So, um, I mean, that first Street Fighter paper I did was kind of doing critical interpretations of empirical data there. And by empirical, I'm just going to use a very kind of loose definition here. And I'm going to say that, you know, even ethnographic methods, you know, data is collected through interviews in often a systematic way, right? And you do some analysis with grounded theory, which is about pattern finding in some ways, and, you know, the traditional quantitative ways of analysis as well. So these are kind of all the methods that I, I've used in various studies. So just to unpack a little bit, in case one, um, what I mean here is that you can see that the user is already doing humanities, right? So a humanistic theory would be useful in explaining that, right? So if you're going to talk about how someone, you know, does art, does music, literature, or even sport, it might make sense to use a humanistic lens to understand that because that's what humanities often talks about, right? How do people create good art? You know, what does it mean? 
uh, for Beethoven to be a great composer, right? Why is he one of the greats, wh whereas someone else is not, right? And sometimes it's about a site of study that involves process of interest, right? I think many of you here are involved with creativity and cognition and things like creativity, critique, skill, those are all things that humanities often engages with as well, right? So you can think of it in this way, the ways that I've used it here is that ethnographic methods of inquiry led to, I'm just gonna loosely use it here, ethnographic data. And you use grounded theory, but that, that grounded theory is in some ways informed by things like reader reception theory here, or maybe the dialectics of Hegel here to understand Midwest hunters here. Okay, so another case I wanna go into very quickly here is that um, ethnographic methods, um, I'm going to do some generalizations here that they often emphasize researchers ask how versus why, and, and that, that's something that I was taught uh, about ethnography, that asking why questions is quite hard. So Howard Becker talks about that when you ask an informant, why did you do this, they feel pressure to answer in a way that's understandable and made logical, right? And ethnography, I think, re really enforces this body-mind dichotomy in some ways because we really want to know what someone did. I mean, you want to know a little bit the thought process, what's going on, but their actions and what they did in the world is often privileged. And eth ethnographers, um, we're often taught about concrete events, right? Just something I learned in class that, you know, only ask questions about reflective opinion after you get concrete details. You know, ethnography warns us, you know, informants have a tendency to focus on what they think should happen Right? But sh uh, the word should is again an ethical value statement being made, right? And you know, you want to avoid informant theorizing for the researcher. So sometimes I question, this is sort of an open question here, you know, sometimes is ethnography ill-suited for BSD in a way, right? So value-sensitive design is often precisely concerned with questions of why, right? But you know, I do want to acknowledge that researchers like you know Chris Lodantic have talked about you know what are the lived-in values and practices. But I still think we still need to get to questions of why do people do things, right? So how do you ask why questions that will generate thick description, right? That's kind of desired in ethnography. We're running short on time here. Okay. <coughs> okay. So I I want to do a, a brief shift and kind of talk about that. Um, what we did here was the grounded theory here, and then one of the, you know, the results that led to it was a system that potentially failed here, right? So I kind of tried to review that ethnographic data through the philosophy of Kierkegaard here in Spheres of Existence. Um, I want to just briefly, quickly go over this, because I'm running a bit low on time, is that another method we developed to try to see how can we do interviews and augment interviews in a way that will quickly sort of elicit values in an efficient way here. And so it's a way to use humanistic methods to augment semi-structured interviews. So we created a technique called futuristic autobiographies here. And uh, basically the context here was trying to understand roboticists and if their values eventually influenced the designs that they created. And we want to interview a lot of professional, you know, well-known roboticists at a conference very quickly, but still get rich enough feedback that we could understand their values rather than just asking robots, what are your values, right? So this technique, as we often do in ethnography, tries to go at it in a roundabout way. <coughs> so uh, it's a little hard to see, but first you present someone with a prompt that is a futuristic autobiography of that person, okay? And then you ask the informant to think about uh, what led to that futuristic autobiography of them. So the informant actually has to write this <coughs> fictional narrative that led to the prompt that you presented them, okay? And the main character is the person you're interviewing. So let me just give some examples. So here we're trying to ask about, uh, you know, what does it mean to be surprised or have a, a, a new finding in, in research here? And in this prompt we ask, you know, in 2026, you write a daily log, you conduct a user experiment with your robot, and in one moment during the experiment, you had an experience that gave you goosebumps or caused you to cry out in surprise. So what did you write in your log today? So that was one of the questions we asked the roboticists. Another question sort of asks roles of robots in society. You're about to retire, you're gonna get this prestigious award uh, for contributions to developing user-friendly humanoid robots. So in your honor, the IEEE Society, Robot Society will purchase your friendly humanoid robots and donate them to three organizations of your choice. 
and recipients of your robots are free to use them as they wish. So what do your robot designs look like? Where would you donate them? Why did you choose these recipients? <coughs> so in, in this way, um, you can think of it as a sort of augmenting semi-structured interviews, right? So semi-structured interviews often start with concrete events and then go into reflection. So how do you get a concrete event uh, when you're talking about values? In this case, we sort of presented the future of the participant and they had to fill in the concrete event that led to that future event, right? It is a fiction that they're creating, but it is nonetheless a concrete event that is informed by their own experiences and their own personalities, right? And then they can reflect on that and then you pipe that back into traditional ways of perhaps analyzing that interview data, such as uh, grounded theory. Since I'm running low on time, I won't go through the findings, but one interesting thing we found is that many robots uh, felt that users needed to uh, adapt to robots' needs, right? So they needed to become sensible users and not expect robots, for example, to have emotions. And they need to do things like learn to program, right? Understand programming, for example. That was a strong thing that happened. And remember, the robots we interviewed here were all humanoid roboticists, people that would design robots that look like hum human humans there. Okay, I'm gonna go through challenges really quick about humanistic and empirical. Uh, there is a big tension between grounded theory and humanities. Humanities is not really about, you know, creating representative data or, or sampling data, you know, getting enough data so that you can be uh, generalized things. Humanities often respects experts' opinions. Um, it, it, it respects an N of one many times, right? So does it make sense to find patterns of interpretation around text, right? Um, does humanities might not agree with that in a way, right? Uh, does it make a sense to collect data with the humanities, right? I, I, I would think some humanists might dis disagree with that as well. So, you know, when you look at Ron Tomato and such, you can think of it as trying to balance between the two. They have this sort of uh, average score, but they have the individual critiques as, as well, right? That, that we so value in movie reviewers. <coughs> when you're doing things like uh, futuristic autobiographies, we found a lot of people are really reluctant to be humanists, right? It's, it's hard to ask someone to create a story, right? You have to scaffold it and, and maybe tell them about what kind of story they have to create. So users are quite self-conscious about creating things even though I think everyone has the, an inner humanist in them in a way, right? And um, as, as for my own experience, when writing papers and talking about this research and trying to say that we use humanities together, this can sometimes be an uphill battle as well, right? Sometimes you need to devote space to explaining concepts from the humanities, and then you need to sometimes make some argument a priori about how this should be judged in a different way than traditional ethnographic work, for example. So the FAB's work, for example, um, w had, had a lot of reviewer comments and was very divisive in HRI. And people talked about things like, well, how does this compare with moral psychology, right? So they wanted me to uh, measure its uh, benefits from that perspective. So, and you know, you're gonna get reluctant readers, right? So uh, when you write a works that use humanities and empirical together, um, the Barzells talk about how do you evaluate something like, you know, these humanistic essays, right, that make debates, right? So th they suggest several criteria here, which I think are, are eminently reasonable, right? So the voice of the, the writer, um, the purpose and implications of the position. But if you're trying to make empirical and the, HC and the humanities on equal footing, then which one, how should you evaluate that work, right? I think many researchers would tend to evaluate only on one or the either, right? So they'll try to evaluate as, for example, a traditional ethnographic work, or they'll try to see this as a humanistic work and only evaluate it from that metric. Okay, so I, I kind of want to return back to future work that uh, my group is doing of blending empirical with humanities. We've been doing a series of studies of treating users as humanistic experts to try to understand if there's a concept of web design periods. So just like this romantic period and Baroque period in art, can you say, say the same thing about web design periods, right? Um, we're also trying to see like, if you can draw from feminist uh, philosophy and operationalize those terms and apply them to things like computational social science. So we did a work in ICWSM on, on Twitch actually that talked about that use concepts um, from Langton here uh, to identify 
when uh, um, objectified language was used on female streamers. Yeah. Wait, uh, where, where are those drawn from? Over here. This is uh, the the chat the Twitch chat uh, tat text. Okay. All the all the the the, the, the chat streams there. Okay, and ongoing future work. Um, right now, uh, through the NSF career, um, we're, we're trying to apply and test the design for authenticity framework to try to bridge between urban and rural subcultures. So <coughs> it's obviously a big issue that's happening in the US. Um, so we're focusing on subcultures that actually have a lot of penetration from both urban and rural populations. So small farmers, you're getting increasingly a lot of farmers coming from the city back to rural areas. Outdoor recreation, nature, you're having a lot of people intermingle there uh, as well. And so while I have the pulpit here, I just want to advertise that we have a CHI 2019 workshop um, on intersectional philosophy and HCI. So if you're at all interested in this topic, you know, you don't have to have actually have, uh, you know, done philosophy or anything. It's, it's meant to be something if you're interested in it, interested in the subject, or you have something in the back of your mind about philosophy, I really encourage you to uh, submit a, a position paper here. And, a really excellent group of uh, people on this workshop. And um, like most research, you know, it's not a solitary endeavor, so I owe uh, much to my students and uh, collaborators here. Okay, thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions.